Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk Gnosis. We're doing a special Q&A episode to uh, fill in some time because we have uh, a bye week here between recordings. So we're going to answer some of your questions. And uh, to help me do that, as always, is Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. And how is the weather in Montreal? We might as well... Uh... <laughs> That's just a whole show. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's all the questions that our audience had for us. It's a hundred percent. Yeah, it's actually it's it's late November here. You know, I don't know when you're going to be watching or listening to this show. So it's uh, surprisingly warm. It's it's enough. Uh, I know we can't get political on the show, but it's enough to make me want to support global warming. All right. Yes. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a joke. I know. All right. <laughs> So uh, let's jump right into it. Um, uh, between yourself and Andre, we uh, got some really good questions here. Um, all right, first one comes from Flagsg. Ooh, that's a that's on, S -S on Reddit. P L A X G. So yep. Thank you. So Flagsg. Thank you, so Flagsg, for such a great question. Do we think the world would be a different place if Gnosticism was as big a religion as, say, Islam or dominant strays of Christianity? Could you speculate on how it could be better or worse? So why don't you take a stab at this one first? I'll throw you under that bus. Ooh, yeah, thanks. That, that's a toughie, huh? Because obviously, as a, uh, I don't just read about Gnosticism, I practice it. So, <laughs> so there, there's got to be a, a reason why I think Gnosticism and uh, uh, Gnostic religion is is fantastic and great, right? You know, I don't necessarily believe it to be better or superior to other religions, but there is a reason why I have converted to it. So, I I, I guess I'm I'm pretty bad at like trying to I don't know. We're not really a converting or proselytizing tradition, which is good because I think I'd be pretty bad at it. <laughs> uh, because. Well, I, yeah, I, it's a good thing you don't make a video every week about it. Then. Good thing I don't make a video every week about it. Um, because uh, the, the ruminating on this on this question, I mean, I mean, just packed into Christianity or Islam, right? You have so much good stuff, right? And you you have this, the straight teachings of Jesus, which are go out and help the poor, right? Give up your own life uh, over over fighting or, um, or or killing, and uh, and the world uh, with these dominant religions um, often seems to be a pretty cruddy place, and we often see strains of these religions that that seem to be pretty cruddy and oppressive, right? Uh, not all of them obviously. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if Gnosticism was as big as, as some of the dominant religions uh, that are in the world, would it become as corruptish and um, uh, um, oppressive too, just by the size of the numbers and, and the way that our world is uh, ordered under the Archons of the Demiurge? So I, I think that that's a strong possibility. On the other hand, would Gnosticism inoculate itself against that because we kind of have these narratives built into Gnosticism that Gnosticism is kind of suspicious of religion, uh, suspicious of power, uh, suspicious of of, uh, of of the demiurge, the demiurgical systems. Um, we have had large Gnostic movements, um, and the two largest were uh, were very pacifist. So we had the Manichaeans, which was a, a huge religion uh, that that was worldwide. Uh, and we had the Cathars, and both of them were, were very oppressed, and because they were both uh, uh, pacifist religions, they couldn't really do much to fight back. So I guess that's my, my speculation. Uh, maybe we will know. Maybe Gnosticism will take its place as one of the world's great religions uh, w within the, the next couple decades, and, and we'll see. But that, that's some of my speculation. I guess I have neither a yes nor no on that. Uh, Father? I... Uh... I don't think it ever would be really as big as um, you know some of the the more mainline religions, uh, and, and I think that's probably a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not specifically the question. But I'd like to answer this one first, I guess. Um, the The reason why I don't think that a mainline Gnostic religion would be a good thing is that it's just not appealing to the vast majority of people um, in a very elitist kind of way, you know what I mean? Like the, most people don't want to spend the time and the effort uh, on the kinds of work that it takes to be a successful quote unquote Gnostic, whatever that means. Um, heck, I don't even want to do it, but here I am. Yeah. Um, and that's fine, and it's not—it's not a bad thing. It's, I'm not casting aspersions on aspersions on people who are, um, uh, you know, just 
going about their daily lives and doing their thing. You know, that's that's most of us. So, um, so I think that it it has always been and will always be a, minor, a minority religion, um, just out of the nature of what it takes to be a part of it. Um, yeah. Now that being said, uh, it, were it as big as say Islam or Christianity. Um, I think it would be very different. I don't think that you would see. So, I it, this isn't particularly controversial, but the way that I see religions developing is that you have a um, an initial mystical experience, uh, a gnosis experience, that um, the person who has it, person or group who has it initially, uh, goes and talks about it to other people. Uh, and then those other people become followers and they try and recreate that Gnosis experience. Uh, some do and some don't. And rules are created and traditions build up around it uh, in order to facilitate that, um, that sharing that experience with others. Um, but in one or two generations, that's largely gone. Right. And, and you are left with the rules and the traditions and the things that surround it, which in and of themselves are, are fine and um, almost universally uh, make the world better, except when they don't. Um, so I think Gnosticism would go that way were it a huge religion. And, you know, that wouldn't be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I kind of sum up my Gnosticism, my worldview, that the world isn't necessarily like an evil cesspool, but the pull of the world, the way that the world is set up, and it's almost, you know, I quote science, even though it has nothing to do with science, like the law of thermodynamics, uh, that everything ends in entropy. The pull of the world is it kind of defaults to crap. Um, so we're always, like, it, that's not necessarily a judgment, right? It's not necessarily a moral thing. It's just that eventually everything kind of defaults to crap. So we uh, uh, we strive against that. So I, I think with that constant pull to default to crap, a worldwide huge Gnostic religion would, you know, it, by default, it defaults to crap. So you always have to push against that. Anyway, I, I think we tackled that one. Sure. Yep. Yeah. I also like default to crap as... Uh... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any whoozle. Um, so, uh, what's next? Why don't, why don't you read us the next one? Here? Sure. Uh, Father, does Gnosticism promote escapism through the promise of uh, refuge in a better non-physical realm? And uh, doesn't it really encourage people to hate their bodies and it leads to all sorts of like kind of mental and self-esteem problems? And that's from Ceaseless Becoming. Thank you, Ceaseless Becoming. Uh, yeah, so that, that comes up a lot. Um, the... Uh, the world-hating dualist uh, Gnostics, you know, if you hate the world so much, why don't you just kill yourselves and, you know, get a, put yourself out of our misery? Um, the uh, So I, I default to Miguel on this one. Um, in fact, he talked about it on the last episode um, that he... Actually, I don't know if it's the last episode. I don't know how far behind I am in my podcasts, but... Um, uh, with... Uh, uh, I want to say Stephen Smith. Is that the guy's name? Oh, Scott Smith? Scott, Scott Smith? Stephen Scott? Yeah, it's, Smith Scott? It's one of those... Uh, he, cool. His name is Smith, certainly. <laughs> okay, we'll put it in the show notes, people. <laughs> anyway, um, they tackled this exact question, and, and, and the answer that Miguel gave is, you know, pretty, I think, standard for um, the, the modern Gnostic uh, way of looking at it. It's, you know, the Christian bodhisattva model, right, that part of the gnosis experience is the desire to pass that on to somebody else you know so you have uh this incredible worldview changing experience that you know says oh yeah well okay so this world is crap and you know we're all drowning in the what was the phrase that i've already forgotten that you used it defaults to crap the defaults to crap and uh and but you know the the true nature of reality is it's actually really all very great, you know, and that um, we are actually divine, not, you know, theoretically divine or potentially divine, but actually right here and now we're divine beings. And um, wouldn't it be great if everybody else knew that they were too? So I think that's a very important part of the Gnosis experience is that desire to, to carry that on. And at the end of the day, um, the world hating part of it, while it's important in those early stages, just goes away. It just it just isn't important anymore. Like, 
who cares if the world is an awful cesspool? Um, it, you know, we're all here anyway, and we're all stuck here, and we all have the same. You know, we we all have to work hard to, to pull together to uh, to make it better for everybody. So. Yeah. That's how I would kind of answer that question. That it's a, it's a promise of refuge in this realm, not a promise of refuge in a future potential, um, non-physical realm. Yes. Yeah. And I also suspect. I mean, now I'm getting into a completely different topic. But uh, <laughs> but hey, um, we really do need to do a show on the afterlife sometime. But I, I think one of the main messages of Gnosticism that I'll that I'll also bring up again later is that is that the divine realm is as screwed up as this realm right that's sort of the big insight of, of gnosticism uh the the divine realms uh the, the higher realms if you want to call them that the heavens i mean i think the translation is usually the heavens that they use are as screwed up as here um so when we're talking about like refuge and better non-physical way we're often probably talking about life after death right and i suspect that life after death might be as screwed up as here unless you you know get to the pleroma so uh so that whole like you know drink the poison get on the hail bop comet thing may not necessarily work out that well for you um so i feel like we could take a diversion here and talk about uh reincarnation but let's not let's uh yeah we'll let's save, save that, that for the later. next i'm sure we'll get that question does Gnosticism believe in reincarnation well i got it at my presentation last yeah. weekend and uh i don't know if i answered it very well so <laughs> i'd like another <laughs> swing at that i think but maybe okay. not right now Okay, somebody somebody asked that question uh, uh, below in uh, whatever whatever format you're watching this in. Yep. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And uh, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please, uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think <laughs> anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption, and back to the show. <laughs> okay, so so moving on. Uh, does Gnosticism teach that animals are also spiritual beings trapped in physical form, or are they just biological machines or something else? That's also from Ceaseless Becoming. Yeah, so starting with the first couple of words, does Gnosticism teach? So that kind of... <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a there's a wide variety of what Gnosticism teaches. But Gnosticisms. Gnosticisms. Uh, uh, yeah, I actually can't think of any specific thoughts on this from the ancient Gnostics, although I'm sure there are. I just can't think of any off the top of my head. Do you? Can you think of anything? 
Uh, the Manichaeans and maybe the Cathars. Uh, sure, right. Were, were, were both vegetarians. Key. Yeah, and they they seem to believe that 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 animals were uh, uh, were sparks as well, trapped in trapped in this world. Mm -hmm. I I suspect, and I I don't have a proof text, and I, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. I I suspect that the Cephians and and other related Gnostic traditions, earlier Gnostic traditions, probably did. Just view animals as as spiritual be or not as spiritual beings, but as biological machines. So, yeah. but some of the later Gnostic -y movements, they did seem to think that they they did have some sort of divine element, even if it wasn't you know quite as divine as humans. Right, right. Um, I've had a note kicking around in my Evernote for a long time that I've been just throwing thoughts into about uh, Gnostic environmentalism, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as, as world-hating dualists, why the hell should we care if we're polluting the environment and all that stuff? Um, so I've been throwing some notes together on along those lines. I should probably add some um, animal rights slash uh, vegetarianism kind of things in that note as well. Uh, and maybe that will be a presentation at some point also. But, um, yeah, so... Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's it. I, I, the, you know, it's the Cathars and the, uh, and the uh, Manichaeans certainly thought so. Um, I think it's helpful for one's spiritual life. Like, I don't know if it's true. I, I think it's a good exercise to try to see divinity and everything. So you right. know that 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 panentheism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so applying that to, to animals and to plants and to, to things around you. Right. So I I think that is. You, you know, an important step on the spiritual path, uh, and and it and can be a whole teaching and actual spiritual exercise in your day to day life that I really think can can help one. Um, right. So yeah, the, even if they're not spiritual beings trapped in a physical form, just uh, considering them as such might um, might help your your psyche and the growth of your gnosis. Right, and you, you know, I, you can I get still into... eat them though. I still eat them. I know they're, they're still delicious. delicious. Um... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, all you vegetarians and vegans Sorry. out there. I know it's just hard, um, and it's more expensive to be a vegetarian. You know what I mean? It's it, it can be. Yeah. yeah. You can yep. get a you can get a cheeseburger for a dollar, but a salad's nine dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, like you you get into the um, is it the Jains who who um, who won't kill insects? I think they you know some some of the really hardcore ones will even walk around with a broom and they'll sweep the insects out of the way uh, yep. in front of them. So um, yeah, that's pretty that's pretty hardcore. And but uh, yeah, it would be an interesting spiritual exercise. And a lot of these things are you know a lot of these traditions and um, practices are more for you than for the outside world, right? So in a, in a sense that, you know, having that attitude towards the other created beings and having, and you know, the, uh, treating them that way is um, beneficial to your own spiritual development in, in ways that may or may not outweigh the benefit to those other beings, so. Yeah, I concur. Great. All right. Um, da, da, da. What's different about Gnosticism today than it was for Simon Magus? What did Gnostics, uh, what Gnosis did he have that allowed him to fly Valhiol? Okay. Yeah. This is one, one I want to start on because I'll waste the rest of the time we have allotted giving a little bit of background. Yeah, uh, we can go a little long. Yeah. So, so we have to unpack that a little bit with uh, talking as quickly as I can about Simon Magus, right? So Simon Magus does actually appear in the canonical Bible. He's in Acts. Um, but there's, um, when we reach and read the early uh, opponents of Gnosticism, uh, the, uh, they, they see Simon Magus as the first Gnostic uh, and the one who started it all and kind of set up a, an alternative evil heretical Christianity. So just like how all correct Christianity and in, in these uh, these people's views goes right back to Jesus. You can draw a line from Jesus to the apostles to to them, and that's correct Christianity, right? Right. Um, Gnosticism, the the evil black mirror copy of <laughs> of Gnos of Christianity, goes back to not to Jesus but to Simon Magus, uh, a dear contemporary of Jesus. And you could, and for these uh, these early opponents of of Gnosticism, you could draw a straight line from every Gnostic uh, back uh, to their evil apostles. 
to Simon Magus. So that may not be historically true, but we kind of have, right away, we have this impression that Simon Magus guy was, was pretty important um, to the early Gnostics. Uh, uh, if he was historical, uh, he may have been at least one of the first people to really promulgate a, uh, 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 or an elaborate Gnostic system and, and really kind of help the movement grow. Uh, something interesting about Simon Magus as well, for, for some early Christian writers, is he seems to be a, um, a cipher for Paul. Uh, the Paul, again, from the canonical Bible. Um, th there's an easy answer for this. Uh, Paul does seem to be sort of a proto-Gnostic. You know, he writes about Gnosis, he writes about the Archons, he writes about mystical experiences. Um, so he, he became an important writer for the early Gnostics. You know, was Paul a Gnostic? You know, maybe, maybe not. But he was at least an inspiration, perhaps a proto-Gnostic. Um, Maybe he was Simon Magus straight up. Uh, um, that's a, again, we need to have a whole Simon Magus show. Or if he wasn't Simon Magus, uh, there was there's kind of a split or a debate in the early. There's lots of splits and debates in the early church. Uh, Christianity is quite diverse. So there there's groups of people who really liked Peter and they really didn't like Paul. You can actually see that in the canonical Bible. You actually have in Paul's own letters, him fighting with Peter. So when it came time for these groups in later generations to talk about why they didn't like Paul, they couldn't call him Paul because that would make too many people angry. They wanted to bring people together. So they, they call Paul Simon Magus. They, or they even Simon. after the fact, they rewrote things that said Paul as Simon Magus. Yes, exactly, exactly. So Simon Magus becomes sort of a, a cipher for Paul. And as you can guess from his name, they say he's kind of an evil magician who's, who has a counterfeit Christianity. So getting into this, this flying Simon Magus question, we we'll unpack <laughs> that finally. We have these, these non-canonical texts where, where Peter and Simon Magus are sort of having debates uh, about what is the right religion and, you know, who is correct. And Simon Magus demonstrates his power by flying, okay? And that wows the audience. And then Peter who, of course, in, in these stories is the true and correct apostle, the true representative of the true religion. He says a, a prayer to, to God, and uh, 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 his power, of course, is, is more than Simon Magus's, and Simon Magus actually falls to the ground and dies, you know, kind of midair, yeah. midair flight. So some people have said, so unpacking the story, that this is a, this is a story that, that's critical of Paul because the flying is, is a code or a cipher, and it's an obvious one, uh, Paul writes about having mystical ascent experiences. He just hints at it in his writing. He ascends up to uh, to the seventh heaven, right? Yeah. He leaves his body. He has a Gnostic ascent experience. And this, this story was a way of criticizing that and perhaps criticizing all Gnostics for having ascent experiences, which seems to have been very important for the early Gnostics, that they have an ascent experience to the highest realms well in this lifetime. Mm, I so, wanted to um, interject here and just put a plug in for a, an author you may have heard of. Um, uh, her name is April DeConnick. She's a April scholar uh, from uh, Rice University. Um, okay, I think I've heard of her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you may or may not have recently gotten a book by her uh, <laughs> called The Gnostic New Age, which I highly recommend for all of our uh, all of our viewers and listeners. Um, and she really kind of breaks down what the Gnostic initiation experience would have been like or could possibly have been like, um, including the ascent experiences that you're talking about. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, well, that, well that's perfect. So, so basically, to, to answer this question, what is different about Gnosticism today than it was for Simon Magus? What Gnosis did he have that allowed him to fly? So if we see that... Uh, that gnosis that that he that he got or that he had that allows him to ascend, uh, we, I, I can say that we're we're trying to do that right now. Like Father, you have a project where you're trying to recreate the uh, the, the gnostic ascent experience, mm. right? Do you mean gnosticascent.com? That's right. Yeah. And I guess what's what's different uh, than it was for for Simon Magus is we don't know their exact ascent teachings, right? right. We don't know the methods that they had uh, and exactly what they did because they if they wrote it down it's been lost or maybe it was passed on orally. So to answer the question, what what's different about Gnosticism today than it was for him that allowed him to fly is is we are we are kind of lacking that that direct knowledge and direct techniques that they used uh, and at GnosticAscent.com we're doing uh, our best and you're doing your best to sort of recreate them from uh, personal experience and from the hints that we have in the texts. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 No. And I got to tell you this uh, this new book is just mind blowing in its insights into this whole thing. It's uh, been a been a tremendous help. 
Uh, oh, great. I, I just I just literally got it, so I, I have yet to crack it. So I can't wait for to... you to read it, because we're going to talk about it all the time. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it'd be nice to finally talk about uh, Dr. Abel DeConnick's work. That, know, yeah, be... we, we never really get a chance to. It, um, it, it'd be great if she came up on the show here and that. Yeah, it'd be great if she came on the show. Please come on the show, Dr. DeConnick. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, no, I, I think you pretty much nailed it. Um, a lot of other specific differences about modern Gnosticism as compared to first, second, third century Gnosticism is, um, you know, the the Gnosticism, capital G, you know, ism is um, for the most part, you know, of course, with exceptions, but for the most part, kind of tied up in a, um, a Catholic Christian uh, rapper, I guess you'd say, to mix my metaphors. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you'd see a lot of uh, Gnostic ecclesiastical churches, apostolic churches, you know, we belong to one. Um, yeah. And so that is, that is a new development. I mean, in the, in the history of Gnosticism, you know, starting in the 18th century and the 19th century, really, um, where these kind of Gnostic churches, uh, start popping up with priests and bishops and, and the whole nine. Um, that probably was not the way that Gnosticism looked in the first, second, third century. Of course, that's not the way Christianity really looked in the first, second, third century either. So, um, the only constant in this world being change, uh, you know, we we have um, a different a different window dressing than Gnosticism has has had in the past. Um, I'm always uh, I'm always quick to say that you don't have to be a Christian to be a Gnostic. That's certainly not a requirement. Although, um, because Christianity is kind of the dominant worldview in the West, uh, it makes it a little bit easier to. Um, to talk about Christianity, I mean, Gnosticism in a Christian context, just because it's the language that people uh, are at least familiar with. So that's, um, it definitely looks different. We, again, we aren't meeting in lodges per se, uh, and, you know, doing these ascent rituals underground or whatever, like the, uh, the early Gnostics may or may not have done. Um, and I think that's a travesty and needs to be corrected, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, yeah, I, will we ever recreate second century Gnosticism? No, it won't happen. It can't happen because the world is so different, yeah. um, and it shouldn't happen, right? Like I, I think the people who are actively trying to do that, and I, I, I think that they're mistaken. I think that, um, you know, it's the same way that I feel about. <laughs> you know, we're gonna lose some subscribers here. Uh, the same way I feel about kind of the the pagan restoration traditions. Like I, I don't think the world needs that. Um, yeah, be a pagan. Hot takes. <laughs> this, this is the hot takes episode. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you know, uh, be a pagan, do all that stuff, and have yeah. you know, be a polytheist and, and worship your gods the way you want to. Um, don't build a little mud hut out in the forest, and you know, forget Wi-Fi to do it. In my opinion, but <laughs> I, I also concur. Like uh, again, we're not saying don't be pagan or right. that pagan restorationism is uh, uh, completely useless, but it's, it's silly to, it's silly to, to think that, uh, we don't live in the modern world. We've got to grapple with the world that we're in. And I'd also like to say from sort of a religious study standpoint, no religion, present religion, even though many pretend, uh, looks like it did when it started. You no, know what I absolutely mean? That, not. That goes for every, every religion that goes for Scientology, that goes for Buddhism, that goes for, uh, the, you name it. Um, yeah. now some religions will tell you we're exactly the same as, as we were 2000 years ago, but it's just empirically not true. And, and it shouldn't be true because, uh, the, the times change. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. We beat that dead horse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, we did. Uh, well, here's one. Uh, that again, we could probably do a whole show on Father. We talked a little bit about it on the uh, the AJC Facebook page, which yeah. uh, you know, if you're listening to this or watching this and uh, uh, you're not a member, you may want to uh, to join up. Cause Sidebar about that actually. So somebody asked me if there was a group for um, Talk Gnosis or the Gnostic Wisdom Network on Facebook, and um, I don't think we need one. I think if you want to have these conversations, the the AJC, the Apostolic Joe and I Church Facebook page is uh, group rather is the is the place to do it. I mean, you don't have to be a Joe and I to go and hang out there, but that's where we are and that's where we, uh, we answer questions. So if you do want to have these kinds of discussions, go, go right over there and do that. Please do. And of course in a, in a respectful uh, manner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I hope that goes without saying, but yeah. recent events may have, uh, 
Unfortunately, yeah. it doesn't. <laughs> so, so a question from Chris Shellen on Facebook that we already kind of tackled a little bit there on Facebook. And, you know, we could probably spend, I don't know, uh, the rest of our lives talking about. Uh, but we'll give it five minutes. The, the Archons and the Demiurge, are they distinct metaphysical beings and realities? Or are they more like Jungian archetypes, aspects of the psyche? Yep, definitely. Yep, I, I also would say yes. Okay, so <laughs> moving on. Um, <laughs> no, <gonna> seriously. <laughs> seriously. Okay, uh, the next question? Just a few words on that. Um, oh. The uh, Whether they are or not um, is almost irrelevant because you're going to treat them as they are anyway. Yeah. You know, whether they're, uh, whether they're real or not, you're going to you treat them as if they're real. Um, because the forces are absolutely real. The, the forces that they represent exist, whether they are made up of the collective will of millions of human people or whether they are forces of nature or any of these things. They, they have a reality of their own. Uh, whether or not they are directed by an intelligence is largely irrelevant, right? So if you, if you believe these things are immovable and unchangeable, well, you know, why are you a Gnostic, I guess? But, yep. uh, <laughs> um, you know, in the, in the worldview of the Gnostic cosmology, we are superior to these forces by nature of the divine spark that exists within us. You know, that divine spark comes from a higher place than these forces do. So we, being superior to them, um, can interact with them in that kind of relational way uh and so and that was the presentation i did last week I, ju I did a presentation on gnostic magic you know what gnostic magic may have looked like and um what it could look like today and uh, and i think that working with the archons as distinct intelligences um is uh, is the way that that was done in the past and i think it's the way that it can be done today yeah, I 100% I agree, and I think um, even though we're kind of being smart, Alex, answering answering yes is very important because the ancient people thought about psychology in the mind very different than the way we do. But but it's it's obvious to me, uh, at least, uh, like when you read something like Secret Book of John, right? They're using kind of psychological metaphors a lot of the time. It's right there in the very beginning of the book, mm -hmm. right, where. Um, um, uh, you have sort of the, the one uh, described as a giant mind. Uh, you have psychological processes, uh, you know, forethought and uh, uh, wisdom, imagination. Um, uh, but they're in fancy Greek terms. You can't quite <laughs> recognize them as psychological, um, which, which is kind of a shame. And uh, we should, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that these, these are just common terms for what goes on in a brain. Right. So I, so I, I think it's also important to, to to look at the psychological view as well, but you know, as above, so below. If, if we're kind of an echo of the universe, an echo of everything, uh, then it, if the archons are real and distinct realities, they're also psychological realities. Right. Um, uh, so it, it's not it's not either or. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, um, I was doing uh, uh, teaching a uh, centering prayer, sort of in a Gnostic sense at uh, at McGill, and uh, somebody was basically like, "Oh, okay, there's the archons." You know, like uh, now I understand them because there they are in my mind, right? If you sit down and try yeah. to meditate, you're going to meet the archons pretty effing quick, right? Because um, because uh, there they are inside of you as, as you try to as you try to meditate. Um, also, I'm going to steal something from Bishop Tim Mansfield. Uh, uh, he, he said, I'm not so super certain I am a distinct metaphysical being, <laughs> so I don't think I'm in a position to judge the archons. Well, uh, I, for the record, I am sure that he is a distinct metaphysical being, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> no, those are excellent points. Thank you. Yes, yeah, but but again, I, I think it is important to to have to have both. Uh, so so I completely agree with you that it is uh, even if they're not distinct metaphysical beings, uh, it's useful to treat them as if they were because those forces are are real and quite evident around us at all times. Mm -hmm. All right, last one then, uh, and this one's a good one, and I um, I struggle with this one, right? So uh, anyway, so Finn McMillan on our Facebook page, uh, the AJC Facebook group says, I wonder if taking a world affirming panentheist position, and we should probably define panentheism because we haven't talked about that actually in a while. Yeah. Uh, it is a, um, a, a spiritual belief where that everything exists within God. So like the Venn diagram of, you know, God being this circle and then everything, right? Um, as opposed to a kind of um, 
split where gods are here and everything is here. Um, or but there's some overlap, but not all. So, yeah. Exactly. I, sorry, I'll, I'll also give my explanation. It's different from pantheism. Pantheism is, if you added up everything in the world and the universe, it equals God, right? right? So if you, tree plus stars plus Jonathan plus cat equals God, <laughs> where panentheism, you can do that math and that's all God, but there's still more God outside of that equation. Yeah. Is that, is that a good metaphor? I've been using well, that one lately. Yeah, no, it's a fine metaphor, but yeah, again, it is only a metaphor, and these things are complicated <laughs> theological uh, things to kind of wrap your head around. And so, um, and in some, in, in some senses, you can't wrap your head around it at all, uh, yeah. and you shouldn't try. But then, you know, when, if one believes in the Gnostic experience, then, you know, you can, you can come to a, a knowledge of that through Gnosis, but... Um, you know, negative theology, the term really does have a few meanings, so... Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's true. Okay, so sorry. Anyway, yeah. right, so panentheism, only because we talked about it a couple of times. Um, if, I wonder if taking a world-affirming panentheist position as a Gnostic is trying to stretch Gnosticism too far. So I think we talked a little bit about this earlier also, that, you know, um, if we're world-hating dualists, <laughs> you know, uh, and absolutely Gnosticism is a world-hating dualist tradition until it isn't. Um, so I, in my opinion, if you have a, <clears throat> how to, how to put this in a nuanced, interesting way. Um, if you start from a position that I'd like to get into this Gnosticism thing, I don't know very much about it, but I think trees are pretty. Um, I, I think that you're going to have to make a few mental adjustments as you go when reading the Gnostic scriptures, but I still think you can do it. I think trees are pretty too. Um, but uh, but you have to understand that the reality that is that tree is less real than the reality of the Pleroma and the, um, the Invisible Father and all of whatever you're calling that and whatever <laughs> cosmological system you're using at any given time. So you don't have to hate the world, but you do have to understand that the world is not the ultimate truth. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I don't think I can say it much better than that. So I, I, I think for a yes or no answer on that question, it is it is actually not stretching Gnosticism too far, but it is it is quite nuanced. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Bam. All right. Anything okay. uh, anything else you want to bring up here before we close? No, I think uh, I think we did a fantastic job. I'll pat myself on the back, and uh, those. But those were also some fantastic questions. So, uh, yeah. uh, uh, watchers and listeners, uh, please keep them coming, uh, and you can put them on the. You can send them to us directly. You can put them on our YouTube page. You can probably leave them in the uh, the HAC Facebook forum. You can leave them on our Facebook page. You can leave them below, uh, and we will we will see them and we will collect them and we will get them answered the next time we do this. Absolutely. I mean, by answer, you know what I mean. We'll, yeah. Uh, and also, uh, we'll probably put a disclaimer somewhere is that these are, of course, are hopefully informed but personal speculations <laughs> on these issues. Yes. Uh, this is not official uh, HAC um, uh, doctrine or any other doctrine. Uh, and these are not the one and only correct answers to a lot of these questions. And these uh, are not the droids you're looking for. These are not the droids you're looking for. And also, if you have different answers to these questions, we would love to hear them. Yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then uh, thanks again. Uh, thank you for collecting these questions. Thank you, Andre, for also uh, collecting questions and helping us out with social medias. And, uh, yeah, so we will see you all next week. We'll see you all on the plural. Bye.